Welcome back to First Things First, and we are going viral. Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson also has skills on the baseball diamond. On February 7th, he was acquired by the Yankees in a trade with the Rangers. Here's what he had to say about playing with his new team. Hey, New York City, I'm here. I got the Yankees hat on. I'm headed to spring training on Monday. I can't wait to see you guys February 26th. We're going to have some fun for that week. And, uh... Hey, hey, Aaron Judge, I know you want to throw some ball passes, so let's, let's play some ball, and uh, we'll see. We'll have a little home run derby, too. Uh, Stan, I'm coming for you, too. We'll have some fun, baby. I'll see you guys. Hey, and let's go win a World Series. Why not? Peace. <laughs> I love it, man. He's shouting out those guys. If I was him, I'd be going to spring training, too. And for anybody that mocks it, don't ever forget, like, Garth Brooks went to spring training. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like one of those, those invites for show. But I love it, man. He's living it up. Why yeah, not? The, the initial thought is, what is he doing? He could get hurt or this or that. But, you know, go ahead and have some fun. Right. Billy I'm Crystal still went to spring yeah, training yeah, with the exactly. Yankees. It's not, I'm just mad he didn't hit us up. We're in New York City. Why didn't right, he hit us up? Right. They Come got on, us on spring training, man. Yeah. It'll be fun. All right. Time for some stories to start your morning. Earlier this week, Greg Popovich caused a stir when he said he's not expecting to have Kawhi Leonard back this season. Yesterday, Kawhi's teammate Manu Ginobili spoke about the saga and said the Spurs are too close to the playoffs to keep waiting. Chris, does Kawhi always to the Spurs to play? No. I mean, look, Isaiah Thomas gave his heart and soul for the Boston Celtics, played through injury. How they reward him? They traded him. Now he, who knows how much money he's going to get on the open market? He's lost tens of millions of dollars, though. There's no question about that. You have to feel like you're healthy as a player. I get it. The Spurs want him on the court. They think he should be able to play. But if he doesn't really feel like he's ready and capable, then I'm, I'm with Kawhi on this one. Every player at some point in their career has to play at 70, 80, 90 percent. Not only the Spurs medical staff, but also a second opinion has said you're good to go. You've proven your value, I think, more over time than Isaiah did in Boston. He's going to get his money, but he's got to go out there and show that he's healthy. Because if you're the Spurs, you're saying, how serious is this? If we give him the $217 million, is he going to play for us if he's 80, 90 percent? So there's a really weird dynamic going on right now. I think it might be more than the injury. All right, last night the Sixers squeaked out one point, a one-point win over the Bulls. Ben Simmons scored a career-high 32 points along with 11 assists. Joel Embiid added 30 points and 13 boards as Philly won its sixth straight game. Chris, how close are the 76ers to contending in the East? Well, they're not contenders yet. If they make the playoffs this year, that would be terrific. And if LeBron James goes west next year, I mean, they, they could be right there in the hunt. The East will be wide open. The thing is, Joel Embiid has to stay healthy throughout the second half of the season. They're 28 and 17 with him healthy, 3 and 8 when he doesn't play. That 28 and 17 is like a 51 win pace over 82 games. So imagine if they get the seventh seed or the sixth seed, that is a tough first round matchup if they're healthy. They're essentially a 50 win team that you have to face if you're Washington, Toronto, Boston, maybe Cleveland in the first round with the guy that I think, and I'm going to say it, is the best center in the league right now. I wouldn't want to see them in the first round. Not that they'll beat you, but they'll make it a lot tougher than you want to have in the first round. Absolutely. And it'd be great for them as a young organization, oh, yeah. this young up-and-coming team, to get those playoff reps, to get that experience, to infuse some energy into a franchise, which has been you know, the perennial, perennial bottom dweller in the league, to start to see some of the returns of the Sam Hinkie process. I think that would be great for this team. So You're I can't wait. Hinkie but I'm, I am. But I, <laughs> but I am with you. I think as long as the bronze in the Eastern Conference, I don't know if anybody else is really a threat. Last night, Oklahoma City needed every second to knock off the Kings. Russell Westbrook hit a game-winning three at the buzzer. He needed just three quarters to pick up his 18th triple-double of the season. Melo and Paul George also chipped in with a combined 49 points. Danny, are the Thunder a threat in the West? All right, it's kind of like talking about as long as the bronze in the East that nobody else is a threat. As long as the Warriors are healthy and in the West, I don't know if anybody is a true contender, but much like the Sixers, I would love to see them stacked up against any of those top, against the Rockets, against the Warriors, because of what Russell Westbrook brings to the table. Now that you've surrounded him with PG, you got Carmelo, he's infused some energy in them. He's playing at as a typical high high speed, going to go out there, going to attack the rim with this vengeance. I hope it happens. I'd love to watch him. No, I agree with you. Westbrook's athleticism overwhelms opponents. We saw it with Chris Paul in the seven-game series. It just wears you out. Heck, a couple years ago with Steph Curry, when they had him down 3-1, it is tough to play against him for seven straight games. So I'm with you. And look, 
They have been great against the elite team until Cleveland just beat them. So now they're six and three against the top three seeds in the East and the West. They're two and zero oh against Golden State, two and one against Houston. Their problem is they haven't gotten up for the bad team. So last night, I mean, they struggled, barely beat Sacramento. But it was good to see them get a win against a bad team because usually they haven't gotten up for those games. On to the NFL. Des Bryant's future is best described as murky. Yesterday, Cowboys CEO Stephen Jones said that they are, quote, trying to understand what's in our best interest. Dallas would save $8.5 million against the cap if they were to release Dez. Danny, what should the Cowboys do with them? Exactly what they're trying to do, which is to convince Dez Bryant to stay with your team at a reduced rate, to get him to pay, take a pay cut. But it's a really tricky conversation to have because you're dealing with egos. You're dealing with a player who was a top five wide receiver in the NFL not that long ago. But as he's getting older and his production has dropped, they've got to get their value for him. And that's going to be a really tough sell because players always think they're worth more than they actually are but I think they're going about it the right way they're very delicate with it and they're very careful not to offend Des Bryant which is important yeah I like what Stephen Jones is doing I think Jerry's always handled him with the kid gloves and even now he's saying I expect him to be back Stephen Jones is saying look everybody's got to be accountable now the demeanor sometimes has hurt us and it's true and it's to a point I alluded to it earlier with uh, Lonzo Ball it's to a point now where Dez's production is no longer outweighing the distractions that he brings. And he wasn't as bad last year, it seems, as far as the distractions, but he didn't produce either. Mm -hmm. I, I think Dez is, is falling off. I mean, from the drop passes to, you know, just he can't go D. He's lost a step as far as his speed. Um, I'd like to keep him but definitely at a reduced rate. I think, too, you have to consider that Dak Prescott's play fell off as well. And it's a huge year for Dak this season coming up. And I think they want to see, hey, is, is Dak our franchise guy? Because they're going to have to make that call. Yeah. And I think if you're Dez, I think you want to give that one more chance as well. All right, we're going back to the NBA. Last night, the New Look Cavs played their first home game since the big trade deadline acquisitions. And the results weren't ideal. Cleveland lost 110 to 103 to Washington. LeBron was his usual awesome self, scoring 32 points, including 14 in the fourth quarter. However, his new teammates only combined for 29 points. Here's what LeBron had to say after the game. You know, like I told you guys, you know, it's still a work in progress with us. And it's not going to be overnight, no matter. You know, the excitement before the break. We got a lot of things to work on, implement what we need to do. But, you know, tonight we still played to our game. We just didn't make a lot of shots. I think we played well tonight, even though we lost. Um, and there's no, you know, I hate losing, obviously. But I think the way we played, the way we shared the ball, defensively we were flying around as well. Um, and those guys just, you know, they, was, they played better than us tonight. So um, I, I like the start. I like the direction we're headed in. Chris, well, LeBron still obviously seems optimistic, but was everyone too quick to jump on the Cavs bandwagon? I don't think so. I mean, I was one of those that hopped on the bandwagon. <laughs> I did it immediately after the trade was made because it wasn't about how they looked on the floor. They were impressive, obviously, in their first two games. I just thought the fit. I mean, all the problems they had in the locker room. You had egos. You had guys that didn't want to accept a lesser role. You had three players in Isaiah Thomas, Derrick Rose, and Dwayne Wade who do the same stuff at this point in their career. They're slashers. They're not spot-up shooters. They're used to being the focal point of an offense. You had, you had guys that could only play one side of the floor. You had guys that could shoot the three but can't guard. Then you had guys that could guard but couldn't shoot the three or give you much offensively. This trade gave them... 3 and D guys, like Rodney Hood, Larry Nance, they're not 3 and D, but they, they're guys that can give you offense, Jordan Clarkson, George Hill, and defense. So now they can improve your defense while not hurting your offense. And they have the athleticism to be much better defensively. Effort is huge in, def in defense, but you also have to have the strength and the speed to be a good defender. You can put forth all the effort you want. If I'm just not fast enough to stay in front of you, it's not going to happen. Now they have guys that do have the necessary athleticism, and so they can, can you know, be better defensively. And finally, the piece, like, George Hill has always been in his best off of playmakers, whether it was Gordon Hayward in Utah or Lance Stevenson even in Indiana. Now he's a guy, a point guard, that can play off of LeBron versus an Isaiah Thomas who had trouble playing off of a LeBron James, which a lot of point guards do. 
but George Hill won't be one of them. And the, did we overreact to the 2 0 start? Yeah, I think that's what we do with LeBron. Like, we, it's the LeBron effect. We always overreact to when it's really good or when it's really bad. It's like, oh my gosh, they're going, they're going to, can they beat the Warriors? Yeah. And when it's bad, it's, hey, it's, it's awful. LeBron, what are they going to do? Are they going to get out of the Eastern Conference? I've always tried to say, look, this is the best player of our generation that we're sitting here watching. Let's just let it play out. I think if you put him on most teams in the Eastern Conference, they're going to get to the finals, and they might even go ahead and, you know, excuse me, win the Eastern Conference. They might even get to the finals. Um, but with this team specifically, I think you see a fresh infusion, and you got rid of what was a disastrous, dysfunctional locker room. And I, I don't want to pin it all on one person, but with Isaiah Thomas in there, there was a disconnect. He was not buying in. Like, when, when, when LeBron went to the Heat, D. Wade was like, I'm giving you the keys. And he said it. And it was very much more than a, it was a, a verbal and a physical, hey, I'm giving you the keys of the team. And he really didn't feel that way with Isaiah Thomas, who went into LeBron's house. And he's he like, felt hey. like it was one in one A. Right. <laughs> and it's never going to be that way. And there were a lot of, and there was 1A, 1B, because you had 1C and D. Wade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of big personalities in there. And I think that's why Cody Altman said, man, let's, it's gotten that bad. Let's just, let's just blow it up. And I think that was the best thing that could happen to this franchise. Sometimes when things are really bad, it needs to get bad to make this type of a move. And I think moving forward, it's, I'm all in moving forward. But I'm actually glad they lost. I want to see how they respond to adversity. Yeah, what's that mean? I mean, how would you describe that type of pressure playing with LeBron? Because obviously these guys, their personalities, they are all in to listen. They're all ears on the leadership of LeBron. But we saw they didn't shoot that well from the field. What's it like for some of these young guys playing next to the greatness of a LeBron and feeling that pressure of, of wanting to perform because they have a lot of responsibility? Yeah, now. as great as it is to play with LeBron because you know you're going to have a chance to win a championship, it is a challenge as well because, one, not many – I mean, the offense, everything is built around LeBron, as it kind of should be. He's a system unto himself. Like, you have various systems. You know, uh, they, you got the triangle. You got the Princeton offense. In San Antonio – I mean, Golden State, they got the ball and player movement and all that. LeBron James is a system. And most of his teams, Cleveland is the first go-round. Miami, now Cleveland again. They play – the same style, which is LeBron-centric. That's one of the reasons Kyrie wanted to leave because at times he'd just be in the corner waiting for LeBron to create for him. He couldn't really be a true point guard himself. So that's a challenge, getting used to playing off of one guy. And then he creates great open looks for you. But there's pressure to make it. Yeah. So, so if, if he's always creating wide open looks for you, and you you know you get a few a game the pressure is on you to hit those shots that's why lebron plays so well individually that whenever he loses it's always viewed as the other guy's fault you know it's always like it's never view, rarely viewed as lebron's fault dallas was at rightly so when he lost in miami his first year there but typically if you don't win it Everybody says, well, he did, LeBron doesn't have enough around him because he puts up such great numbers. So all of that is pressure playing with LeBron James. Which I thought, and because he's that's one of his best assets, one of the best facilitators yep. we've ever seen. And I thought what you saw last night is LeBron was facilitating, and when you shoot 16% from three-point range, you're going to see struggles like they did last night. And with that facilitation comes a tremendous expectation that some players step up to, and others don't, which is why I think Kevin Love has struggled somewhat dealing with those expectations as being the number two guy. And when he gets back in this lineup, when he gets back to healthy, I'm curious to see how he plays yeah. with these other guys. So I think there still is very much, there's a lot of basketball that needs to be played, and we need to watch it play out and to see how those types of things play out. I mean, Kyle Korver has struggled at times yeah. to knock down that shot. And when you get, I mean, that's absolutely, and you get shoot. that glare. Because he's gonna, he's he's the best player on the planet, and he expects you to knock down those buckets. And if you don't that one time, second time, what is there a doubt that creeps in? Are you gonna wonder, hey, what's it like in the locker room? Yeah. Is there going to be a tweet or some post? He'll stop passing you. You're yeah. not gonna get the ball. <laughs> exactly. So all those type of dynamics, I want to see how those play out before I'm all in. But again, it's really a question of 
Can they contend with the Warriors? Because Boston's falling apart. Toronto, I have very little belief in them in the postseason. So it's like, here we are again. It's just a new cast of characters around LeBron. Yeah, and I think these young guys that they got in the trade, I do think they are relishing the spotlight mm -hmm. because George Hill is relishing being on a contender again. I mean, eight of his nine years, I believe, he's been in the playoffs. You know, he's with Indiana when they were battling Miami for the Eastern Conference crown. He was in San Antonio, Utah, even last year they got to the playoffs. So he hated it in Sacramento. You're not playing for anything and you're a veteran. The other guys, Clarkson, Nance, Rod Rodney Hood was in Utah putting up good numbers, but only the hardcore basketball friends really knew about him because you're in anonymity in, in Salt Lake City. And then, of course, the guys from the Lakers, I mean, you're, you're not making the playoffs. And another thing about those guys, Nance and Clarkson, Clarkson has put up nice numbers for the Lakers since he's been there. He's been a nice spark off the bench, a big scorer. But it's never been about him. It's always been about, even among the young guys, Brandon Ingram, now Lonzo Ball, Kyle Kuzma. Like, he's net Julius Randle. And so I think now Clarkson is looking forward to, okay, I'm going to be in the playoffs. I'm going to be in the Eastern Conference Finals. I'm probably going to be in the finals, and people will really get to see me do it on a big stage, on a good team. That's when your reputation changes. Jamal Crawford, he used to be known as kind of a one-on-one -on -one guy. Ah, can you win with him? He puts up numbers. But when he went to Atlanta and then he began to help playoff teams play well off the bench and put up those same numbers, that's when his reputation changed and people began to love him. The same could happen with these young kids with the uh, Cavs. It's very clear these guys, this whole team, this Cavs 2.0 roster is in the honeymoon phase. But I'm very curious to see how does the marriage work, like long term. Because everybody does. Uh, you know, in the NFL, when a new guy comes to your roster, or a guy comes back off IR, and you see him out of practice, he's got a bounce in his step, everybody will start yelling, no, fresh legs, the man's got fresh <laughs> legs. This team is very fresh right now, and they can, you can feel it, not only from LeBron's standpoint, being infused with these young guys, but these guys, all of a sudden, it's like in baseball joining the Yankees. Like, you're all of a sudden, you're talked about a lot more, you're playing in prime time, you're playing for a final spot. Like, it lifts everybody up, but again, how does it go for the rest of the season? How does it play out? And that's it, what the you bring a great point up, too, about Kevin Love. They're yeah. going to reintegrate these four guys, and yeah. now you got Kevin Love coming in. All right, coming up, we got some more quarterback talk. Is Baker Mayfield actually the best QB in the draft? That is next on First Things First.